Well, brethren, have you been encouraged? Amen. Amen. It's been good. Brother Ricky's text this morning is going to be in Revelation 2, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 8 along with that. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Amen. Brethren, the church at Smyrna was a very populated city. It was on, it was a port city, and it was uh, established um, in the ancient world, and it was a very affluent city, a very idolatrous city. And the saints that lived there were suffering not because of something they had done, but it was because of their belief in Christ Jesus. And not only did they suffer from the culture, but they also suffered as a result of the religious people around them. But Jesus knew this. He knew this. And he said some things to this church. So it's important to know who said it. Jesus is the one that said it. And when Jesus speaks, every word has meaning. Amen. And those words are attended with power and authority, so much so that they cannot be thwarted. It is important for believers to know this about their Savior. So this is the one. This is the one who said these things. He is the first and the last. He is the one who was dead and is now alive. It, he is the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the righteous judge of all, the Holy One of Israel, the great shepherd, the intercessor. This is the one who is speaking these words to his church. I thought it was fitting to look at Revelation 19 because it's good for us to have a picture of our Savior. Brother Jason brought out last night that he is the glorified Savior. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Yes. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath in his vesture and on his thigh a name is written, King of kings and Lord of of Lords. Amen. This is the one speaking to the brethren at Smyrna. Yeah. And what he said is important. <clears throat> when Jesus speaks, we want to make sure that we pay close attention to what he is saying. <clears throat> he said, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. He knew, Jesus yeah. knew what was happening. This isn't the first time that Jesus said this in this section of scripture that we're looking at, I know thy works. He said it to Laodicea, and he said it to some of the other churches too, but there's a difference. The works that these brethren were doing were unto God. They were righteous and holy. <clears throat> Jesus uh, is aware of what's going on in his body because he's the head of the body. Remember, Amen. Yeah. whenever he came to Saul on the road, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Amen. 
Had Saul ever seen Jesus? But he was persecuting his church, and therefore he was persecuting the Lord Jesus. When Stephen was being stoned, Jesus stood to receive Stephen. Why? Because he was being persecuted for his name, and it was affecting the body. Jesus knows, brethren, he knows. How could he have said that they were in poverty, yet they were rich? That sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? The world's assessment of the situation and Jesus' assessment are quite different. In fact, they are polar opposites. Jesus spoke as one who knew what it was like to endure what these brethren were enduring. He knew this by experience. And when Jesus was in the earth, he humbled himself. He took on the form of sinful flesh and condemned sin in the flesh. And so Jesus knew. He knew their, their poverty. He knew what it was like to be impoverished. And he even said that he didn't have a place to lay his head. That's what he told his apostles. So he knew what it was like. But was Jesus really impoverished? Whenever everything was peeled back, he was the king of glory. If you want to say it in man's terms, he was the richest man. He, he, he is the king of glory. He is the heir of all things. And even though this earth was not his home, he still ruled it. He still ruled the earth and he still does. So he's reminding these brethren in Smyrna that their names were written in the Lamb's book of life. That they were joint heirs with him in God. They're, they are going to inherit the earth along with all of God's people. All things were theirs. But for the time, it appeared as though they were in poverty. But Jesus, in his comforting assurance, said, Thou art rich. Now, not only did Jesus know about his people, he also knew about those who were blaspheming, who said they were Jews but were not. And, And Jesus is going to deal with those people. But why did he say this to his church? As the brethren have mentioned, there are only two churches in the seven that Jesus had nothing bad to say about, and this was one of them. So Jesus wanted to encourage his people. He wanted to encourage them to finish their race. He wanted them to know that the tribulation would only be for a time. You know, brethren, tribulation has an expiration date. (laughs) It does, and it's good because you can be in the middle of a tribulation and it seems like it's going to be forever. But Jesus is encouraging these saints that there is a time limit on your tribulation and there is a time limit on your poverty. This is what he's trying to tell them. Jesus did not want for his people to be swallowed up by these waves of persecution that were coming upon them. So there are times, brethren, in our own race when we can hear the Savior say, press in, hold tight, stand your ground. This is what Jesus was saying to the saints at Smyrna. I was thinking of this song, and it's all familiar to us. Ho, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing. Victory is nigh. See the mighty host advancing, Satan leading on. Mighty ones around us falling, courage almost gone. You, have you been in that situation yes. before? Yeah. Where you're just, you just think you can't go another step. Yeah. Hold the fort, brethren. Yeah. <laughs> See the glorious banner waving, hear the triumph blow. In our leader's name we triumph over every foe. Fierce and long the battle rages, but our help is near. Onward comes our great commander. Cheer, my comrades, cheer. Hold the fort, for I am coming. Jesus signals still. Wave the answer back to heaven. By thy grace, we will. And brethren, I wanted to leave you with a response. Now, there was a brother that we know about that responded to what Jesus said to the saints at Smyrna. And his name was Polycarp. Many of us have heard of him. He is a real brother. He's among the just men made perfect now. But this is what he said. O Lord Almighty God, the Father of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, 
through whom we have received a knowledge of thee, God of angels and of the whole creation, of the whole race of man, and of the saints who live before thy presence, I thank thee that thou hast thought me worthy this day and this hour to share the cup of thy Christ among the number of thy witnesses. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna, and he was martyred for his faith. And this was his response when he was told to rebuke Christ, deny him. He said this, 86 years have I served him and never once wronged me. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Amen. Brethren, we can be this way too. We can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And when tribulation comes, stand strong. Hold the fort. It's going to be hard to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> in conclusion, let me go to page four. Okay. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not. I know what Satan's going to do to you. And I know it's going to last 10 days. And I know after 10 days you're coming out. Amen. Revelation begins with these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. It is not only a revelation that comes from Jesus, it is a revelation of Jesus. The judgments of the churches teach us about Jesus and how he judges people. That Jesus is a judge. Romans chapter 14 and verse 10 says, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul told pagan people, that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man. Yeah. Jesus is a judge. And as Brother Gibbon has already said, Jesus assesses the works of the churches. He does not only judge by saying you are damned or you are saved. He judges and assesses the kind of works that are coming out of the churches. You see, God has made investments and he has given advantages. Yes. Yes, he, is. he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Jesus assesses the churches based on the advantages that he has given to them. Yeah. And if they are to be criticized, it is right because they have not taken advantage of the advantages. There is a difference between advantages and taking advantage of advantages. And if you don't take advantage of the advantages, the advantage will be your disadvantage. Because Jesus knows what's available to the churches. And if he has criticized the churches, let me tell you, it's because they didn't take advantage of the advantages. Jesus is a righteous judge. There are judges in the world, but they're not righteous necessarily. But Jesus is a righteous judge. That is why in Hebrews 1 that God has exalted him above his fellows. is because he loved what was good and hated what was evil. And he has a scepter of righteousness, and that is the scepter that he's wielding in the second and third chapters of Revelation. That's right. That's right. Isaiah says this, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Yeah. Amen. And that's still the way Jesus is. Amen. He is that way in his churches. Jesus will not receive evil from his churches. He will refuse it, and he'll not overlook good. He will receive it and delight in it, and that's what we see in Revelation 2 and 3. He's a righteous judge. The point I'm making is simply this. Jesus is not unaffected or indifferent toward what is being produced by a church that calls itself by his name. And there are theological views 
that would lead us to believe that he is somewhat indifferent about what's coming out of the churches. Maybe you've heard someone talk something kind of like this, trying to explain the love of the Father. Well, you know you have that little child, and they're just starting to talk, and they just jibber, 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 and it's just so wonderful. And that is exactly the way God is with us. Really? Yo, you've never heard that. Oh, yeah. That kind of talks out there. If you develop a theological position that leads people to believe that Jesus is indifferent when it comes to judgment, Jesus is still going to judge the churches. And that's what we see here. Seven times it has been said to each church, this is the opening shot of the Son of God, I know thy works. And then he goes to being a judge. You know, that's said of us. That's said of us. That's said of the Word of Truth Fellowship or wherever you go. That's right. Jesus knows what is coming out of that church. That's right. That's right. And he has something to say about it. Now, to Smyrna. One thing that makes Smyrna peculiar to most of the other churches has already been mentioned, but let me go ahead and say it. You brethren that stole my thunder, stop it. <laughs> this is a church free from rebuke. There is no rebuke to the church at Smyrna. There is no stern warning to the church at Smyrna. There is no correction for the church at Smyrna. Jesus did not say to them, nevertheless, after commending them for good things. Jesus did not have to say to them, I have somewhat against thee. He didn't have anything against the church at Smyrna. If he did, he would have said it. He did not have to say to them, Remember whence thou art fallen and repent. They hadn't fallen. Or he would have said something. Jesus did not say to Smyrna, Thou hast left thy first love. They didn't leave their first love. And you don't have to either. He did not say to them, Thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. They weren't charged for tolerating false teaching because they didn't. He did not have to say to them, thou art dead, because they weren't dead. They were a living church. He did not have to say to them, thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, like he did to Laodicea. In fact, he said the opposite. You're rich, which means what? They were taking advantage of the blessings in heavenly places while Laodicea wasn't. And that's why they were poor. Oh, brethren, to understand this, the kingdom is not automatic. God places you in a place where you can grow and thrive, but you have to take advantage of that place if you are going to do that. Smyrna did that. I love to think about this. What can we learn from this? We can learn this. You can walk in a way that pleases God. Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. But you know, we can't do that. Will God tell you to do something you couldn't do? Just because five churches weren't taking advantage of this doesn't mean the other two weren't. They were walking in a way that was, don't you get that sense when you read the letter to Smyrna that Jesus was pleased with this church? Jesus can be pleased with a church. He can. Even our ancient brethren. In Hebrews chapter 11, every single report in that book is a good report. By faith... The elders obtained a good report. Now that's what Smyrna was. This letter was a good report. You can too. Enoch had this about himself in Hebrews 11.5, that he had this testimony that he pleased God. And he had a whole lot less resources than you have. Right? You can please God. Here's what I'm saying. You don't have to live in a way that requires a lot of hard talk from Jesus. It doesn't mean that there never is. I I don't think you could possibly be that way because 
Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. All of us began foolish. That's just the way it was, right? And there's a measure of that probably in every one of us. And so sometimes Jesus has to, you know, poke at you. But that does not have to be the standard way by which Jesus deals with you. Let me tell you this. Jesus won't always deal with you if that's the way you are. In the new covenant, Jesus is not willing to put the bit and the bridle in the mouth. If you stay mule-like and harden your neck, you'll just be suddenly destroyed and that without remedy. Jesus is not going to continue talking this way to churches. You know what I mean by that? Oh, he'll strive, but not always. And so we have a church that was tender toward Jesus. And if you are tender-hearted toward Jesus, he will be tender-hearted toward Amen. you. Amen. Ephesians 5.1, be therefore followers of God as dear children. Amen. Don't you pray that prayer to the Lord? You do. I want to be a dear child. I look, I look at the other five churches and I don't want to cause grief for Jesus. I don't want to do that. Do you like rebuking your child all the time? No. You think Jesus likes it? No. No. Always having to say hard things? Do you think he finds pleasure? No, he doesn't find pleasure. This is not how you, you do not have to live this way. Amen. Smyrna was an example of that. Another thing about Smyrna is Smyrna was a suffering church. Here's a church that had favor from Jesus and at the same time was suffering. It was a church in tribulation. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Tribulation, that's a very strong word, tribulation. Give you, let me give you some synonyms that relate to that word. Like suffering, distress, trouble, misery, misery. Sometimes life in Christ can be miserable. You bet it is. It's not always a bed of roses, brethren. We're not always smiling. Wretchedness. Unhappiness. Sadness. Heartache. Woe. Grief. Sorrow. Pain. Anguish. Agony. You know, it said of Jesus that he agonized in prayer in the garden. Jesus is familiar with tribulation. Thank you for that word last night, Brother Gibbon. Yeah. Absolutely. He knows what it's like. Travail. Okay? Tribulation can be likened to a person's experience on the sea. Yeah. <coughs> Psalms 107, 25, and 27 says, He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifted up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, which means you can't see the sky anymore. That's how, that's how that is. It can, be, it can be rough. And they go down again to the depths. They just crash. Their soul is melted because of trouble. You know, David talked about that kind of experience. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man are at their wit's end. Master, save us. We perish. I don't think they said, hey, master. Master. Hey, master. Master. Master, there's master. They were crying out. Life can be like a troubled sea. That's what tribulation is. Hey, God can get you melted and get at your wits end. It's God that did this. He's the one that commanded it. And if you can see all trial right... It may be delivered by Satan, but it was commanded by God. Amen. It's important that we understand that. It'll make trials bearable, brethren. Some of our brethren that have gone through trouble, which by, by the way, I did want to say this and I'll just move right on. Tribulation is something you're thrown into. It's not something you go looking for. It's something that comes finds you. They laid their hands on the disciples. Hey, they took them. It'll find you, Brian. It is something that you can't get out of. You're going to be there 
as long as God wants you there. Mm -hmm. Ten, days. Ten days. Right? Mm -hmm. It's something that's outside of your control. Remember David saying this? I was for peace, but they were for war. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're living such good lives among the pagans, and they still hate you for it. Yeah. Right? Tribulation. And it's something that causes pain and distress. It's hurt. It hurts. Tribulation hurts. Our brethren at Smyrna were hurt by these circumstances, but they weren't overthrown by them. Okay? Jacob was bereaved, you remember. He thought of Joseph. But it is important. Maybe it wasn't how it really was, but it's how he perceived it that caused the trial to be what it was. Remember, they went into Egypt. They... Joseph, he didn't really reveal himself to them, but he said, okay, you know, if you're, if you're really serious, you're not spies, one of you stays here. And Simeon volunteered. They get back. They tell Jacob. Remember what Jacob said? I'm bereaved of Joseph, and now I'm also bereaved of Simeon. And you want to take Benjamin? Remember what he said? All these things be against me. Tribulation. Tribulation could come at you at all sides like waves do. I mean, they, waves don't smack in like order. They just smack one way and smack the other way, and you're tossed in all directions. You ever been tossed in life? You just kind of get tossed around. Yeah. Job was tossed in life, remember? Yeah. He was tossed in life. Just in succession, his kids died. Reports came. He lost all of his assets, and pretty soon he was struck with boils from head to toe. Tribulation can be like that. It can come in succession. They were already in trouble at Smyrna. And Jesus is saying, more is on the way. Uh, yeah. Tribulation, brother. What are some of the specifics of their tribulation? We really don't know a whole lot because Jesus didn't get into the specifics. I think there's wisdom in that. Yeah, yeah. I think the more you focus on the details of your suffering, there's a temptation to be overcome by it. So Jesus was very general. I tried to be real specific about it, but I found myself launching out into opinions. Yeah. So let me just say a few things and try and stick with what Jesus said. One is they were impoverished. I know thy poverty. Yeah, poverty. poverty is a trying condition. Yes. Generally speaking, the extremities of life are trying conditions. Wow. Winning the lottery is not so great. Yeah. Ask people whose lives have been destroyed by that. Yeah, right. So Solomon said, give me neither poverty nor riches. He didn't want to be tempted to forget God and not lean on God, and he didn't want to be tempted to steal. The Apostle Paul had to learn, to learn what it meant to have need without being distracted. Remember him telling the Philippians that? He had to learn this. Brother, I'm not sure that any of us have really gone through that kind of poverty. I mean, there, there's a measure of poverty that we've probably all experienced. Okay, but, you know, I can go down to Walmart and get what I need. They couldn't. This was poverty. I mean, this was like real poverty. I remember that when we went to India. That was one of the things that struck me, Brother Given. When we went to India, the poverty. I had to be exhorted by Brother Given. Turn the lights out. Why turn the lights out? No big deal. I have lights on all the time. I never think about my electric bill because i got plenty of money to pay it. They don't. Turn the lights out. I don't think I know that I'm exactly sure, sure that I could be competent to really handle this word, poverty. But they were in poverty. Whatever that means, Jesus acknowledged that it was happening there. Yeah. And it was a form of suffering and trial for them. What poverty may mean, Sister Tasha already alluded to this. It may be they had the same kind of experience that the Hebrews had. It may be possibly. It may not be that they were, began in poverty, but maybe they ended up poverty. Maybe. Remember the set of the Hebrews that they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. Because they were believers, they were taken advantage of. Hey, this goes on in other countries. If you say that you're a believer in another country, it may be the very thing that brings you into economic disadvantage. You pay more and you get less because you're a believer. Maybe that was their circumstance. I'm not sure. I think it's interesting that this was not like a Haitian society. This was not everybody's poor because of the society. This is a poor society flourishing and Christians being poor in it. Yeah, that's right. yeah, Something that's was right. going on there. I'm not yeah. sure what. Yeah. 
but it constituted a trial. Yes. Okay. Amen. Now, the thing I do want to get to here for just a little bit is the real nature of their suffering here. And it wasn't just poverty. It was trouble, and it was religious trouble. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer, which tells me this was about to escalate. This conflict that was taking place was about to escalate. We shouldn't be surprised by that because quite often... Do you realize some of the greatest troubles that Paul experienced began in what was taking place in a synagogue? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about this? I'm sure you have. I went back to the book of Acts and it was astounding at how many troubles and horrible things were born out of what was taking place in a synagogue. Of all places, a synagogue. A place where God's name was to be remembered and saints should be able to find sh shelter in a synagogue. And yet that was the very place where trouble came out of. Yeah. Jesus experienced it himself. When he, was, when he was in one of the synagogues, he just let them have it. He let them have it. A prophet is not received in his own hometown. He let them have it. And they were not tolerant of what he said at all. All they in the synagogue. When they heard these things were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And, and that wasn't enough. Some of us have been like, you've been like kicked out, right? But did they attempt to kill you? Let's go on with what, what happened here, brethren. They rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him. Methinks they put their hands on him. What a strange thing, huh? You're going to go where we say. Okay? But they led him unto the brow of the hill. They didn't lead him to the brow of the hill just to threaten him and give him a little talk. That they might cast him down. You see, religious person, persecution can be very vicious. The Apostle Paul, brethren, was not just hailing men to prison. He was giving his consent to their death. And he was making havoc of the churches. That's the kind of persecution they were facing here. Be faithful unto death. Amen. Now, what do you think of a church like that, brethren? Because Smyrna was not only a suffering church, they were a persevering church. Yes. Brethren, let's put these things together. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. That's not like in succession experience. That's like that's all going on at the same time. In other words, this is a church that knows how to work for God and bear up under tribulation and bear up under poverty. They were doing it all at the same time. That's what Jesus is saying. <coughs> hey, this is quite a testimony for this church, brother. And I want to I, I do them right. You see, some quit when tribulation comes. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in the time of temptation fall away. Everything was going really well when times were peaceful, but when they had really had to suffer for that same faith that brought them that peace and joy, they fell away. Smyrna did not fall away. Okay? I want to commend this church. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Smyrna did not faint in their minds. You know why? Because they were considering Jesus. 
They were keeping the exhortation. You see, we can learn, we can kind of learn a lot about this church by the fact that they were enduring. I mean, you don't just endure automatically. There's something behind the scenes that's taking place. You remember in Pilgrim's Progress, one of those astounding things that he saw of the water being thrown at the wall that had the fire on it, kept throwing the water on it, but the fire was never put out. And then you get behind the wall and see that there's a man there feeding the fire with oil. There was a lot of good things going on in Smyrna, which is why they were persevering, brethren. That's why they did not faint. They did not quit at all. The truth be known, from one sense, this might have been like Philadelphia. Thou hast a little strength. And yet, from another perspective, you can see great strength in their perseverance. Yeah. Proverbs 24.10, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. But what if you stand in the day of adversity? What do you say about someone like that? Great strength. Yeah. That's how these brethren were. This is, brethren, why we glory in tribulations. Yeah. Hey, tribulation doesn't do anybody any good except those inside Christ. Yeah. Tribulation worketh patience. Yes. So if you're in trouble, hang on, because at the end of that trial, you're going to be stronger than you were when you went in. Yeah. It works patience. Amen. It makes you more determined. Haven't you seen that when you pass through trial, you pass through trouble, and you're walking by faith, and you're, you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake, and it's not because of something horrible you're doing? And you're like, boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand firmer ground. You're not moving me. Amen. That's the way your faith will respond in trouble. You'll be more determined than ever before. I'm going to be faithful to Jesus in this. And that's how Smyrna was. Okay? You see, brethren, here's my point. Not all churches glorify God by great expanding evangelistic efforts. You don't read about that in this church, and I'm certainly not against that. That, that truly does glorify God. Don't get me wrong. But this also glorifies God. When a church stands up to trouble and says, I will not deny Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do to me. And we have brethren that are doing that right now. And I commend them for it. And Jesus commends them for it. Now, let's move on. What kind of a message do you give to a persecuted church? What would you say to an impoverished church that was bearing up under trouble? What would you say to a church you knew more trouble was on the way? What would you say? Jesus said this, I know. That's his message. That's his message to this church. Jesus, brethren, can say a lot in a few words. You realize how long this letter is? I wanted to print this thing out in like normal form. You know, we send out epistles of encouragement once a month at the Word of Truth Fellowship to try and encourage the brethren. So a number of the brethren in fellowship will be led and they'll write some kind of a letter of encouragement. Jesus' letter. This is Jesus' letter to a suffering church that had more suffering on the way. This includes what Jesus said about himself. This includes Jesus' assessment of the church. This includes an incentive for them to bear up under their suffering. That's all he said to them. You realize how many words? Let me say to, about myself because this is a particular infirmity on me. How many words I have to say to like get the point across? Jesus gets at a point across in like eight lines Amen. Yeah. and it's enough to make that church stand because you know what a church that's suffering and bearing up under suffering needs to hear they need to hear this from the son of god i know i know you see the point is this it's the one who knows that is the power behind that word I'm the one who knows. I've meditated on this and considered it, and this is the way God has given this to me. I wanted to say a lot more because there's so much more that can be said of Jesus. Let me just limit, limit it to this. Jesus knows as the God who sees. Whenever Hagar, remember she was, Sarai put her, put her away, 
You remember where she went? To the neighboring city? She didn't go to no neighboring city. She was pushed out into the wilderness where there wasn't anything and there wasn't anybody. Here was this woman with a child who was starving. She was starving and there wasn't anybody out there to care for her until an angel appeared to Hagar yeah. and provided a well for her. And you remember what she said about that occasion? That's exactly it. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Ber Leharoi, means the one who lives and sees me. Amen. That's our God. Amen. See, he knows in that sense. He sees it. He sees it. It's astounding, brethren. God sees all things and yet is able to see specific things. Certainly, you've been up on a plane. Those of you who have been up on a plane, I've been up on a plane, and there are some advantages when you're on a plane because there are things that you see up there that you can't see. But you notice the higher you get, the more that your ability to see things that are near and detailed are compromised. When you're 36,000 feet in the air, you don't have a clue what that street sign says. But Jesus does. There is suffering right now going on in Pakistan. I can't give you names, I can't give you times, and I can't give you the heart of the ones who are persecuting them, but I'll tell you this. Jesus knows the names, the time, the intent of the hearts of those who are being persecuted, the intent of the heart of those who are persecuted, and he is going to deal with this matter. He sees it. He is the God who sees. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. You know what that means? It doesn't matter where you go in any quadrant of the world. You are safe. Amen. He sees. Amen. If you're in Smyrna, he sees. If you're in Philadelphia, he sees. If you're left out of Lystra dead, he sees. If you're cast out of the temple in Jerusalem, he sees. He knows what's going on. I don't know. I don't know all things that are going on. But I'm not the judge. Aren't you glad he is? Because he sees. Brother, he knows all the things that have happened in your life. When you have suffered for righteousness sake, Jesus saw it and it was noted and it's going to be dealt with. He sees. I love that thought. But now let's go on with this. What I'm showing you is just what it means by when he says, I know. <laughs> That's wonderful encouragement. He knows as a shepherd knows his sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. If you ever wonder, does Jesus care about his people? He died for them. Jesus has an invested interest in those he died for. More specifically, those who have taken advantage of the atonement. And he's not just about to sit by and let that investment go down the drain. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's not going to do that. Yeah. No. He is not going to do that. He says, I know. I know. Which means I have seen this and I care about what's going on there. You see, there are people. It's horrible. It's a horrible thing. Men have the capacity in the flesh to see horrible things happening to people and to care less. You know that this is the case because Jesus talked about that man that fell among thieves. Here comes a priest, goes down on the right side. Here comes a Levite, goes down on the left side. This man is broken and bleeding and maybe near death, and they could care less. There are people that get, like, get entertainment out of watching horrible things that are taking place today on YouTube. They like enjoy this. But Jesus is not that way. Not with his people. He's a shepherd, and he cares for his sheep. I know my sheep and am known of mine. He cares for them. It's so important that we leave the brethren with this understanding. This will not make the people of God self-centered to tell them God cares for them. No, that will not happen, brethren. Don't, don't shrink back from this. This is like an area which, against which there is no law. Tell the people of God that God cares about them. Maybe they don't realize that today. Maybe they're halting in unbelief of some kind. They can't see it. Help them see it. He cares for them. 
you know this is true because if, if this is true of Isaiah, it is of, of the people of God, of the Jews, during Isaiah's ministry, it is more so true of those for whom Christ died that God cares for them. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. Why? Because he cared for them. God's not a robot. He responds to what he sees. He sent an angel because he cared for them. That's why he sent him. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Brother, it wasn't primarily because of who they were. It was primarily because of who he is. He cared for them. So Jesus says, I know. You sense the tenderness of that kind of a statement. But more so, Jesus knows as a shepherd because he is with them. He is with them. I've always been intrigued by what we might call the Christmas text of the Bible. You know? They were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, if these were shepherds, and Jesus is a good shepherd, I can hardly believe that Jesus is going to neglect his sheep in the night. You see, Smyrna was like in the night. But when Jesus says, I know, what he means is this. I'm abiding with you in the night. I'm keeping watch over you. Brethren, the presence of deity is the guarantee that the saints can pass into trouble and pass out of tribulation. Yeah. It is the guarantee that they will not fall. Yeah. Him being with them. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Why? Because I am the Lord God, and I am your Savior. The saints don't stand, brethren, primarily because of their strength. They stand because of his strength. Amen. It's his strength. That is so good to know that and to see that. Thank God for this word. I, I know, okay? I know. A couple more things and I'm done. Jesus knows as the king of kings yes. a righteous king. You see, there are people that know and there are people that care, but there are people that know and care but can't do anything about it, right? And they would like to. I would like to go, I would like to, go to the Middle East and mop it up. Wouldn't you? Just kind of mop it up, wipe it up, and this persecution would be over in a matter of seconds. You know, God could do that. He could do that. It could just be over. Maybe we're on the 10th day for these persecution for these. Wait, we don't know. God can do these kind of things. He can do this. Who was that brother? Who was that brother? Uh, not Aristotle. Who was that brother that said, if I were God, I'd kick the world to pieces? Yeah, we, we might do the same thing, wouldn't we? Well, God could kick the world to pieces if he wanted to. Yeah. Something's being worked out there. But nonetheless, this is a, Jesus is the king of kings who says, I know. This is the one that is on the throne at the right hand of God that says, I know. I know what's going on there. I know. Okay? <clears throat> you know, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 19 has been deemed as the great commission. Let me retitle that. It is the great commissioner. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. What does that mean? You go in the knowledge that Jesus is sovereign and over all. That's the point. The big message there is not just to teach the disciples. That, that's good. I'm not diminishing that. But that's not the first thing he said. He said, disciples, if you're going to go, go with this knowledge. I have all power in heaven and on earth. And if you know that, that will change how you minister. Yes, it will. Yeah. It will. This is the king of kings. This is the uncontested king of heaven whose will is immutable. Yes. God cannot be frustrated. 
God is the only one who has free will. Free will is the ability to execute your will without any contesting. That's the way God is. He has that kind of ability. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. That includes those of the synagogue of Satan. You've got to think this way. If God gives you into the hands of your enemies, you've got to think this way. He's over them as well as me. They're reputed as nothing. Herod, he was reputed as nothing. Pilate, he was reputed as nothing. Nebuchadnezzar, when he tried to destroy those three Hebrew children, they already knew this, that he was reputed as nothing. And he said, we're not bowing down. Why? Because they knew God was over all. If you know... And this is something you have to work to keep hold of. But if you know that God is over all, it will give you the kind of confidence that enable you to go through the fire and out of it. Amen. You see, he's the king of kings that says, I know. And he rules with a righteous scepter. Let me tell you what that means, brother. It means that it is not possible for wickedness to ultimately prevail over righteousness. Yes. That isn't even possible. Yes. If you, brethren, are receiving conflict because you've done what is right, then this simply, brethren, has not become a battle between you and your enemies. This has become a war between the Son of God and your enemies. Jesus will never let wickedness ultimately prevail over you. He will not let that happen. Amen. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. Mm -hmm. That is right. going to happen. That's right. But now he knows as he which was dead and is alive. Smyrna, brethren, was not victorious in a conventional sense. Smyrna did not throw a stone at their enemy and cut their heads off. Hmm? That's not how it worked here. That is not how it worked here. They were not victorious by throwing down their enemies. They were victorious in this, that they did not love their lives unto death. And that is the victory we receive from Smyrna. Hmm? They were faithful unto death. Remember Jesus talked about my faithful martyr Antipas. My martyr. I want Jesus talking about me that way. I don't want Jesus to be ashamed to identify me with himself. And I know fundamentally you're not identified with Jesus based on what you do. But this did endear Antipas to the Son of God. Just as it endeared Jesus to the Father when he gave up his life. Because the word of God and the purpose of God required it. You can do the same thing if you are required. You see there are worse things that can happen to believers than dying. Yeah. Truth be known, death does not hurt the child of God. I've not been near death, so I can't speak with a lot of authority on that. But I can speak with a lot of authority right here about Smyrna. You, know, you want to know what our takeaway from Smyrna is this, that you can be faithful under much duress, trial, hardship, misery, hurt, pain, poverty, in trouble, more troubles on the way, and you can be faithful unto death. Amen. Jesus yeah. would never have put them in that trial unless he knew that they were faithful to handle it. Amen. They were faithful, brethren. He counted them faithful to handle this. Maybe the reason why some people aren't martyred, I know this can be very dangerous, so please don't take this and like judge everything this way, but maybe sometimes the reason why certain people aren't martyred is because they can't handle it. Isn't that possible? Yeah. This church could handle it. And our takeaway is this. This church went through a lot of trouble, and they came out of great tribulation. And they had a wonderful reception, just like our beloved brother had when he came away from the synagogue of the Libertines, Stephen. Stephen was dishonored on earth. But when his soul left his body... He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Amen. 
you can have that same kind of witness too. Thank you, brothers.